I'm going to mute you, Gerald. <laughs> well, I'll, I will. I will come and see you as sometime in the next month, and I'll, and we'll and we'll uh, look for more. Nice to see you, Frank. I'm going to mute you. Hey, good to see you. <laughs> Great job you're doing here, Debbie. Oh, thank you. Did uh, Judy White get in touch with you? Judy not Snow, yet. Judy Snow didn't get in touch with you? She's uh, a new not And I got in contact with her. I thought she might not be in your distribution. Um, Judy Snow, and we have the head of um, Morris Arboretum. Um, um, uh, Mark uh, Inzano. I think they. I think they have a membership now. Okay. Really, really I'll keep. Them. I'll keep an eye out for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, folks. We're going to get started in another minute or two. Um, please mute yourselves. This session's being recorded, and turn your cameras off. Thanks so much. From England, we have some Williamsville near Buffalo, Buffalo, Colden, New York, Ontario, Michigan. It's great to see everyone from all over the United States and I guess we can say the world, right? Okay. All right, I think we're gonna get started. Uh, people are still coming in, but that's okay. Um, my name is Debbie Miriam. I am the reference garden chair for the American Conifer Society. And it has been great to host these uh, gardens that are in the Northeast region for these virtual Zoom sessions. And I hope that if you enjoy it, uh, you will. there's a few more spots left in the last three, so you can still sign up. Um, and so what's gonna happen is I'm going to uh, have people, if you have questions for Tom, you can put them in the chat. And if you have not used the chat before, the button is on the bottom of your screen. You can press the chat button and put your questions into the chat on the right-hand side. So uh, Tom is going to give his presentation and then we're going to do a Q&A afterward. And I'm gonna remind everybody that this session is being recorded and will be posted to the ACS website in a couple of weeks. So again, thank you so much. Um, I know it says the session's not full yet, but the people are still arriving and we're gonna get started. So I'm going to introduce Tom Drave from Drave's Arboretum and he's gonna take it away. You ready, Tom? Yes, I am. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, my name is Tom Drapes, as Debbie mentioned. I'm the president and curator of Drave's Arboretum. And uh, Drave's Arboretum is relatively young. It's only about 30 years old. Uh, it's a quite jam-packed with trees. I and mean, when I say jam-packed, I don't mean there's trees on it that are planted close together. They have plenty of space between them. But before we get started, uh, while I give this talk, many times I'll probably say the words I and me is while I'm discussing how the Arboretum got started, but make no question about it. There are literally dozens of people who have contributed their time and effort, uh, equipment to make this happen. And it would be uh, very difficult to mention all of them. And, and then of course people would get upset, uh, the ones that I didn't mention. And another component to tell the story of Drave's Arboretum is Drave's Tree and Landscape, because I'll, I'll talk about it every now and then as um, I'm talking about some specifics with what we we're actually doing here before the Arboretum took its foothold. So it started in about uh, 19... 93, I had purchased a piece of property 
uh, and a couple others uh, progressively not far after, and it amounted to about 23 acres. And just like anyone else or a homeowner that has a sizable piece of property, you select trees that you like and you plant them. But obviously I, I had quite a bit of room. So in being involved in the green industry, there are a lot of trees that I, I like to obtain and plant. But being involved in all the green industries in my Wait, area, how do I see it? The, uh, I was approached a while back and they say, Tom, you seem like a knowledgeable guy. Can you um, start giving plant ID courses for the membership? And I said, sure. So we brought them out here. And then as it progressed, we started adding more trees to our landscape. Uh, to help promote these classes. And you know, it worked out quite well. And we started giving classes to um, garden clubs and um, green industry uh, professionals. And it, it progressed quite well. And then as it progressed uh, with Draves Tree and Landscape, we had a large, a relatively sizable landscape design and installation that we were um, proposing to a customer. And in the traditional format, our landscape designer would design it, put it on paper, and we would show it to the client. And uh, we would open some books and, and show them some pictures of trees and shrubs that were proposed for the landscape. So, this particular customer, he said, there's no way I'm spending this kind of money. I want to see these trees and shrubs in person. So we brought them out to our plant collection on our piece of property. And then a light bulb went off. And so we decided that any large landscape design and installation that we would bring the customers out to our plant collection and we would show the trees uh, up front, and it worked out quite well. So once again, we had to start adding more trees and shrubs to facilitate the, the tree and landscape designs. So at that point, you could almost say that the tree collection almost came into to plant hoarding. So as the collection started gaining more notoriety, uh, there's people in the industry such as uh, Tim Brotsman, Keith Warren, Michael Durr, uh, Dr. Chris Lully, who have all been here or uh, we've had conversations about what we're doing here. And they're all of the consensus that, you know, Tom, you got a large collection there. It's very nicely laid out and very beautiful landscape. Um, you know, what are you doing there? And I said, well, what do you mean? It's my backyard. He says, no, with a collection like that, you need to start taking steps to perpetuate this, to move it forward in the event of your timely demise that, you know, it, it's still going to be there for the public to enjoy. And uh, I think it was Tim Brotsman who really was harping on me about that. And I says to Tim, well, Tim, I got news for you. I ain't planning on dying. And he says, well, you'll be awfully surprised when it happens. So then it was Dr. Chris Lully, uh, who I had met and started working with, and he was instrumental in moving the Arboretum forward, uh, getting it organized, uh, getting it accredited, and we're going to talk about that later in a PowerPoint, which I'm going to present right now. But when I'm talking to people in person, I always tell them there's two stories to Drave's Arboretum, the real one which I just told you, and the one I got here designed to educate you a little bit more. And it is not allowing me to do it. Tom, 
Um, just click on the up, up on the icon on the in the top red piece. Just click on that icon. The top red piece. Yeah, you see where there's an icon of the screen. Try clicking on that. I don't see that. Uh, all the above the word design. Up, up, up. See, there's a little icon up there. Nope. Yeah, to the left, keep going to the left, 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 right there. Click on that icon, double click. Oops, there all right, we, uh, um, so here's the opening picture of the Arboretum. Obviously this is uh, 30 years in the working. Uh, basically what is an Arboretum? It's nothing more than a collection of trees, usually, utilized for study or display. And I, as we go on in the conversation, I don't know what the laws are in other states for having an arboretum, but I look at this definition, I, I, I characterize it as a very loose term. So here's an aerial photograph of the, of the land that the arboretum was developed on. And if you look at this yellow line here, this is all the property that was purchased in a few deeds over time as it came up. And this is in 1964. And you're gonna see the, when we got started with putting a road in in uh, 1993, this is just an overgrown jungle and all had to be cleared, except the only open spot was this area right here, and this was a cornfield. And down in here is a swamp, and up over here is the old abandoned gravel pit that we started to reclaim, most of it's done. And through here is a stream that flows through. It's called Murder Creek, and it flows all year. And when you get down to this section here, where you do see a significant amount of trees, that's because that's on an escarpment and it's about a 40 to 50 foot drop. And obviously there was no reason for the previous owners to farm that because of the cliff. So those trees got left. And we're gonna talk about uh, installation of the road that was put in the design. And that road is basically gonna start right from here. And it's gonna come across into this field and then it's going to turn here and come down this uh, small little lane here. It's going to come out on the other side of the block. Uh, here's a picture from aerial view from 1980. And here's that gravel deposit I talked about from the aerial view. And this is the cornfield over here. And this is that swamp area I talked about. And this is the house that uh, I own and live in my family up front. And here's a line of uh, Lombardi poplars. If you remember Lombardi poplars when they came out, they were the craze, but they turned out not to be a long lived tree because it got cytospora canker and, and died as quick as it got big. And if you look down the bottom here, you can age this photo by the Plymouth Arrow. So here's another aerial photograph of 2012. And here's the road, as I discussed, it's about a quarter mile long, comes from Harper Road to a parking lot, which is all the largest parking lot now, consumes all this area. There's a water feature and the road comes down through here. And, and as the discussion goes, we're gonna talk about several areas in the Arboretum that have a, a name given to them. And this one over here, which is actually down the valley, one of the first areas to get cleared and trees put in is called the sanctuary. There's another area over here. This is called the fairway. And this area here is called the pinetum. And of course, with any large project like this, you need forced labor. I mean, la a labor force. And our labor force was, this is my wife, Kimberly. These are my two sons, Nathan and Spencer. 
Uh, this is just the nephew. I'm waiting her for him to get older so he can push a wheelbarrow. Got about another three years. So this is in 1993, and this is the first part of the road that we put in. And, and like I said, from the aerial photograph, um, it was all a mess. There, in my opinion, there were no trees of value because the most of it was honeysuckle, multiflora rose, uh, hawthorns, just nothing that was what I call presentable. And I have to say too, that at no point did I wake up and say, hey, we got that property, let's start an arboretum. Um, made a lot of mistakes, I had to do a lot of moving the trees around to get it to what it is today. And when we put this road in, the thought was not building an arboretum, it was just gaining access to it. But over time, everything you see here was cleared away and new trees were planted. And as the excavating began and hillsides were taken out throughout the whole property, um, walls had to be built to hold the edges back. And you can see in here, these are just all hawthorns and what I'm gonna call junk. And this is probably about 10 years later. And as you see, all the trees were cleared out and new plantings were put in with understory plantings or rock wall planted. And there is a ginkgo tree, which is now quite sizable that was planted on the edge of the road. And this is a picture from the other side of the entrance. And now it's about 20 years later. And you can see that the canopy has developed. It's completely over the road. Understory plantings uh, thriving quite well. And if you walk there, you'll find some uh, microbiota growing in there on the hillsides. Uh, off to the left, there's a small grove of uh, Japanese fir, which uh, is quite spectacular in the winter time with the heavier wet snows, as long as we don't give enough to break the branches off the trees. And there's a sizable metasequoia on the bend of that road as you continue down it. And so about 1998, a friend of mine said, who was in the construction industry and had all the dozers and pans and excavators, he says, Tom, why don't you let me build your water feature there? And of course I claimed poverty and he had to do it for free. And he said, okay. Um, but this is that area that was behind the house that was, I, I labeled it as a swamp. And this is what it looked like a few days before we got started. And we came in and we cleared out all the shrubbery. And it's like I said before, I mean, even at this point, there was no intent of, of building an arboretum because you can see right here was a tree that was a plant that's got a tag on it. And it was just a red cultivar, red maple, and you know, they'll grow in moisture conditions. So I put some over there, but the tree had to be moved. And at one point when we decided that, you know, all right, this is gonna be an arboretum. The first year we moved about 70 trees because a lot of it was no rhyme or reason. And that's when I think my son started to become annoyed with the uh, arboretum project, but we got through it. And then they came in, uh, they removed all the topsoil and put it in piles. And this type of pond, had no dike in it because it was a swamp and it's what they call a dig out. So everything had to be dug out and there was no advantage to building a dike to raise the water and get rid of a lot of the, the uh, debris from it. So they made three giant hills that are throughout the Arboretum. And this hill in particular, if you were to go there today, is now has trees on it. There's a uh, Pinus flexless over here. I think that's Vanderwolf's pyramid. Over here are some young Jeffrey pine. Here's some Serbian spruce. Your Ponderosa pine, uh, Pinus pews. And on the back side of it, there's also some conifers on it. This hill is 
mostly planted with conifers on them. And as the pond was done, it's about 14 feet deep. It, uh, they did hit springs on it and it started to fill up on its own. And you see over here on the back side is another giant hill that they, uh, they built. And over here behind all this, this is that gravel deposit I talked about. And over here is another section. This is a rock wall we built out of shot rock. It's probably about six feet tall. And when this pond actually fills up, the water is going to go all the way up to the top of it because over here is a feature called the pond patio, which we'll talk a little bit about. And uh, it just makes the use of the pond a, a little bit more pleasing, especially if you wanted to go swimming because you got six feet of drop here and you can dive off in it and your feet aren't hitting the muddy depths of the pond. So I consider the pond a lot more usable for uh, friends and family if they decided they wanted to come swimming here. And so here's a picture. Oh, it's probably 20 years later. And as you see, all the trees are growing and they're happy and fine. And all these trees, this is where the uh, cornfield was in the overall view. And all these trees were planted. And within the 25 years, maybe that this picture uh, of growth before this picture was taken exhibits that, you know, the, the old adage that, you know, plant the tree in the right spot, you're going to get marvelous results. And the, a lot of these here are white pines, and I don't even think two people can put their arms around some of them. The only trees that weren't planted is this small little group right here. And these were those trees that were on that escarpment uh, in the aerial photograph. So if you uh, walk through here and took a step, you would be taking a leap of faith. Because like I said, it's about 40 to 50 feet um, down to the creek. So we installed a pond patio and it a, has a gravel, pea gravel walkway to it with a spine of this called chaw rock. And it's the exfoliating top layer that comes off of the Onondaga escarpment in our area. Farmers plow it up all the time and they want to get rid of it. And I was happy to take it. And there's also a collection of uh, cattle repairs down each side of, of different cultivars. But when the leaves are out and everything looks, looks nice, like I said, there's uh, white pines in the backdrop. Down in here is uh, one of the weeping hemlocks. And we have a weeping white pine over here. And somewhere in this ma mess of uh, foliage is the uh, varied directions uh, lark. And over here is Pinus pungens globosa. And it's probably about eight feet tall. I'm always amazed about dwarf conifers when you just let them go and take their own route. And it's a popular spot uh, for weddings and uh, prom picture taking. This is from the Attica School, which is not far from us on there for their prom pictures. They all came out. So here's a, the beginning of what we call the fairway, which I showed you on the aerial photograph. And this is what it looked like when we got started. Here's Murder Creek run through it. And once again, these are mostly just scrub apple trees that seeded themselves from old farmers' orchards around here. And there's some ash and some dead elms, which had really no value to them. And well, we built a bridge in there to gain access to start our salt on it. And you can see in the beginning here an area that we started clearing out. And just look at the condition of the bridge when it was originally built as the photos get to older photographs. You can see how the creek has taken its toll on it. But this is what it looks like probably five years ago. 
and it's called the fairway because it looks like a fairway. And it has an alley of different species of trees down either side. And down in the, the fairway behind these trees is where you'll find some collections of conifers on this side and this side. Down on this end here are some uh, Atlantic white cedars. Uh, I think they're called Yankee Blue, the cultivar. But this is on the other side of the fairway and the Yankee Blue um, Atlantic white cedars would be behind the person taking the picture. And you look right here, that's the bridge. And up in here, in this opening space is another thing we're going to talk about where a gazebo was built and it overlooks the arboretum. But and there they are, the Chamaciferous Yankee Blue. And there's a sizable um, Ogon, Dawn Redwood. And that tree is actually in the alley of trees on either side of the fairway. I believe it's the only conifer that is in the actual fairway lane. And if you go to the left-hand side, if you're standing on the bridge, there's a, a variegated uh, cultivar of uh, Picea mariana. And normally when we plant trees, we plant them in groups of three to five. We give them about, depending on the species, and the size that they're gonna uh, grow to, they normally get about 35 to 40 feet between them. And what we hope is with planting three to five that down the road, we at least have one that makes it. But there's some Sitka spruce over up in here and uh, Koyami spruce here. And if you go to the other side, uh, there's a Skylands Oriental spruce. And there's a bunch of other spruce over there, but they're just common everyday plants that are used in the landscape. And down on the fairway is a popular place for weddings. This one here, they had about 300 people at it. It seemed like the tent stretched from one end to the other. And there's the wedding party. You can see the condition of the bridge. And another area we have is called the sanctuary. And to get down to the sanctuary is down the escarpment. So down in the front or the lower portion right here is the uh, stairway that had to be built to get down to it. And once again, I mean, it was just all down there was mostly sumacs and gray dogwoods. Um, multiflora rose, buckthorns. And you go down there today, because I said in the beginning that this was one of the first areas that we started developing. And you can see the stairway is right over here. But there are some uh, bald cypress down there. And what I like about this bald cypress is behind this is actually a uh, a uh, grist mill, mill race from the uh, 1830s where the water came from the mill and returned back to the creek. But if you go down in there, this tree has actually developed some of the cypress knees. I never knew they were developing until I found with my mower mowing behind the back. Uh, here's a, a pyramid uh, fir here and over here are some Juniper uh, sea green and Taxodium ascens, which is as the people that come visit the arboretum, probably one of the most commented trees that they like is the uh, pond cypress. And here's the gazebo, which we previously talked about. Uh, this is uh, the top view. Uh, there's just some. Uh, regular native uh, hemlocks. Over here is the uh, cultivar Greenwich White, which is a very nice display of the 
new foliage coming off in a white color. And here's a picture of uh, the gazebo overlooking the fairway and some heavy snow. And one thing I didn't mention is here's a street light and these line down each side of the fairway for uh, events that we have down there. And when you're in the gazebo looking down, this is what the uh, fairway looks like. And this is a, an event uh, from MCCC, which is a college that we partnered with that any of the students that are getting a degree in the green industry or certificate or whatever they offer, they have to come to the Arboretum and they have to go to our plant ID course. We used to do that with several colleges. Uh, one was Alfred, Alfred State and Finger Lakes College, but they dropped their program so we don't see them anymore. And then there's the Pinetum. And what is a Pinetum is basically a collection of conifers. And the uniqueness of the Pinetum is that this property or all around our area is a lot of it's formed by different glacial tills. And this is about a four acre piece. And it is just a nice, real sandy loam soil. And the conifers just love it. But in the backdrop here is one of the, uh, oops, very sensitive uh, pointer. Uh, this is a Japanese larch in the back here, and here's some sequoia dendrons, a cultivar called Hazel Smith. And if you're not familiar with that cultivar, it brings uh, that species into a lower hardiness zone because we're a zone five. But you got to loose use that term loosely because when I say zone five, I interpret it as uh, we have zone five with zone four occurrences. And especially with this plant, when we do have extreme cold weather, parts of it do die from it, but the plant seems to bounce back. And cork bark fir, which is a beautiful plant. If you ever seen a nice full size one. And Abies vecchii, covered in snow. Spectacular time to visit the Arboretum. In Oriental Spruce, I think if you're not familiar with that plant, it's got the smallest needle of all the spruce trees. And I think Michael Durr quotes it as, to see her is to love her. Probably one of my favorite spruce. And here's uh, Nana Serbian Spruce which this one here is probably about 14 feet tall, very dense conical plant. Most generally these are planted in the landscape and they keep trimming them into to mounds, but if you let them go, they develop a central leader. And you know, this is what you can have, it's a beautiful plant. It's another thing in the Arboretum too, we don't do any shearing or manipulation of the size or the uh, shape of the plant. We just remove what's dead and dying and maybe any structural pruning that's required. Uh, also, Waits Golden, uh, Virginia scrub pine, we have some very big ones, very nice plant. It uh, is green during the summer or yellow green, but it takes on a golden hue during the winter months, quite spectacular in the landscape. And uh, there's some Pinus strobiformis, I think is Western white pine or maybe Southwestern white pine, but Pinus strobus is the correct name. Um, here we have some sun-kissed arbor vitae out here in the front. So as things progressed with the arboretum, we installed the pond and Basically trees were planted closer to the pond. We fanned out and we were basically just watering trees with five gallon buckets 
and that kind of got monotonous all the way up until one year where we planted a bunch of new trees and then we start having a drought. So what that meant was not only were we watering the trees planted that year, but the previous year to, to obviously protect our, our interests in the property. So we realized that we needed an irrigation system and we hooked it directly to the pond and that's where the water is drawn from. But it goes throughout the whole facility. And what I mean is it's not the type of irrigation system where you turn it on and these sprinkler heads pop up and, and water the lawn. Cause you can see here, this is what the lawn is. I mean, it's an arboretum, it's about trees, not the lawn. So you have all these grates that appear to be drains. Well, they're not. If you pull the top off, there's a hose bib in there. And with a 75 foot hose, you can almost reach every tree in the facility. And then as things started progressing with uh, becoming accredited and forming a board of directors, which we're gonna talk about, uh, we decided that we needed to have a facility to uh, bring people in to give our seminars and an office space for the Arboretum. So we started building the Richards Complex. And this is another spot where uh, the Draves Tree and Landscape comes in because all this, all this lumber that you see in this is from trees that were cut down from the tree company and, and were recycled, except for obviously the structural laminated beams and uh, the treated beams here. But everything else is uh, from trees that we had cut down. And just like any construction project, it took a while. If you ever work with uh, carpenters, you know what I'm talking about. But they start from the top and work their way down and uh, picked out some colors for the siding and it's fully insulated. I think it's about 3,500 square feet and then a small little foyer was built and added to the front and we have a garage door in it so it's easy access. You have any seminars that you might want to bring something big in. We don't have to mess around trying to get it through the smaller doors. And the office space is up top. And this is the interior. Uh, we have a small little countertop here, a little kitchen uh, area in the back. Um, these stairs here are retractable and they fold up into the ceiling so that when we give seminars, we can use all the space. And if you look at, there's a camera up in the ceiling. And if you look at the screen, that's the Conifer Society's website. And these, this paneling here, uh, I think they call it shiplap, also from trees that we cut down. But most of this is uh, different species of oak and maple, which were from trees that were actually cut down in the uh, historic Forest Lawn Cemetery in the city of Buffalo. And there is also a species of wood in there of a tree that was planted from the Pan Am exhibition in 1901 that the city of Buffalo had hosted. And, uh, you know, it's used by garden clubs and seminars and there's Barbara Evans right there. And so we had the building, uh, we had a board of directors. Uh, so what we needed to do was legitimize, certify, whatever word you want to use, the arboretum to, so the more or less uh, prove to the public that, you know, this is what we have, it's an arboretum. And so through the effort of Dr. Chris Lully, um, he told us about a, a program called ARBNET. And ARBNET is put on by the Morton Arboretum. And basically what they do is they certify uh, arboretums. And there's a whole list of criteria and it's not small. 
and you know they'll work you through it and it's an accreditation level from one to four. So initially uh, when we applied for it they gave us a level two and there's several hundred level twos involved in this program and through the diligent work of the board of directors and other people a few years later we reapplied and we obtained level three and that's no small leap there's only like about 34 level three arboretums involved in this program and some of the biggest hurdles are um, being involved in plant science and not just it's got to be documented and it has to be accessible. I mean, you have to be able to go somewhere and find, uh, in our example, Dre's Arboretum. I mean, what are they involved in in plant science? And one of ours was uh, new plant introduction. Uh, we have several plants here that uh, derive from witches' bloom, brooms or um, just chance seedlings that, that we have found. And we monitor them and if some of them are worthy, they're put into the tray. And some of the, the better ones are street keeper honey locust. Uh, there's a, a dwarf form of American um, sycamore called Drabrat, which are all Drave's Arboretum introductions. So at this point, of a board of directors was formed and uh, we were on our way. We had all our policies and procedures um, into play through the guidelines that ARBnet uh, had, had devised for their program. And so the board, we thought that, you know, we did have a bona fide cer certified arboretum. So the board of directors, um, determined that we would get an LLC because you can get those overnight and we would operate under that. And then we would apply for a non-for-profit, which can take quite a while to get. So I had approached an attorney about the LLC and he said, what do you want to name it? And we're gonna call it Dre's Arboretum. And he came back a couple of days later and said, nope, you can't do it. And I don't know what the laws are in other states, but the law is in New York State that if you're going to have an arboretum, um, it needs to be incorporated under the education law applied by the Board of Regents of the University of New York State. And so why do they do that? Because New York State covets about 40, maybe 50 words that you just can't use in any business shape or form. And what they're doing is they're trying to protect you, the consumer, because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are listening to this who go on trips to other states and visit family members. And when you got some downtime, you go see an arboretum because every one of them is different. Well, by this uh, law of, of having a regents corporation, New York State is more or less telling the consumer that, that you're going to an arboretum and that's what you're going to get. And if you put up a sign in front of your house, uh, like the generic definition I gave you in the be beginning, just a collection of trees, if you put up a sign in front of your house, Joe's Arboretum in New York State, you're actually committing a crime. So when we approached the attorney about it, uh, he said, we can't do it unless we get the Regents Corporation. And uh, I says to him, well, what's that gonna cost? He said about $7,000. And you know there just wasn't any money in the budget at this point. And he also told us that the, you're going to start out with 7000 but it's probably going to cost you more when you can test it and you're probably not going to get it. And I says, well, why is that? And he said, well, think about it. Your arboretums are always affiliated with a college, 
for a municipality. There's very few of them that are just uh, governed by uh, individuals. So it was kind of depressing. And, you know, I really did not want to put a sign out front, Joe's Tree Collection, because that's not what it was. So I'd called the Board of Regents, and the woman there actually had picked up the phone. And I asked her, you know, do we need an attorney to, to file this paperwork? And she kind of laughed and says, no, you don't need an attorney. But uh, if there's something wrong, we're going to help you get through it. And uh, we'll help you out fulfilling all the application needs. And we did that. And it took about a year, a little less than a year. And... Then after that, we had the bona fide certified arboretum in New York State. And then it was uh, a few years later, through the diligent work of Barbara Ever Evans, that we became the uh, reference garden for the American Conifer Society. And basically, that's um, a compressed. Uh, story of how Draves Arboretum got started. All right, thank you. Thank you for that, Tom. That was great presentation. And we have a lot of questions. And uh, I'm gonna get to the beginning. The first question is, um, let's see, hold on. Oh, uh, se several people wanted to know about, we noticed some fencing around some of the plant material. And so how do you deal with deer and is the fencing for deer or is it for other purposes? It's for deer and every plant that gets planted, it instantaneously gets deer fencing to it. And the deer fence gets removed. Well, for deciduous trees, once they get a, a trunk caliper that's five or six inches and larger, we will remove that. But for some of the conifers that they like, it has to stay in put and it just gets enlarged every three or four years. Because we can't we can't tolerate deer damage. Who wants to go see a you know tree where the lower six feet's been eaten? Have you thought about uh, fencing in larger sections of property to protect them, or is that not feasible for you? No, it's not feasible at this point. But the thought has always uh, occurred that would probably be a, a better uh, idea. Um, can you? Oh, I'm sorry. Reality is, it's not in the budget. Yeah. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about um, tree labeling? What are your trees labeled, um, or are they not? Because we know you do a lot of tree identification courses, so do you not label them for that reason? Mm -hmm. I would say probably 98% of them are labeled. They have the genus, the species, uh, the common name, and the date they were planted. Uh, people that come out on tours, that is the uh, most common question is, when was this tree planted? Interesting. Uh, so Christy asks, how does your family feel about the Arboretum now? Have they gotten ex more interested in plants or are they moving away from plants? No, they, uh, they're they still involved in it. And uh, well, my son, one of them, he's out there doing stuff out there right now. He's just got downtime and he's out there whittling away at it. But no, that, the whole family, they're involved in it and they love it. Uh, next question is, do you have woolly adelgid there? Oh, we haven't seen it here yet, but uh, I have seen it in Buffalo and Amherst. Okay. Um, and someone asks, uh, can you just talk, uh, I, I know I saw on your website, even during COVID, that you were running um, educational programs. Yes, we Are, were. Are you, can you just, are most of your educational programs focusing on, focused on ID or do you focus on other aspects of education? They can be any aspects. Uh, some, of, uh, some of them are requested, like we have some schools uh, for students and they will uh, bring the criteria to us and tell us the format a plan for them. Other ones are garden clubs that uh, we, they want to come out to visit the Arboretum and then, you know, we'll select a topic, uh, meaning 
you know, 10 top trees for garden patios or, or something like that. And other times it's just open uh, tree ID. It's, it's just, we can critique it to whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And then also we do give classes uh, for municipalities, we call it the Tree Academy, Municipal Tree Academy. And, you know, we'll have 60 uh, municipalities show up and we'll do all kinds of topics of tree planting, pruning, tree selection. That's great. Uh, another question is, um, do you have, uh, as far as your understory and your shrubs, do you focus on particular species or do you have a, just a wide variety? Oh, we have a wide variety. Try to focus on really what's going to work in that place instead of just, you know, picking up something that is an understory plant. Those are some mistakes that we made a long time ago is just purchasing plants because we didn't have them. And a lot of them are site specific. So we try to work with that a little bit more. I heard you mention an, a nursery earlier. Do you have uh, recommendations for nurseries in your area that focus on um, conifers? Uh, we get a lot of conifers from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Russell's is one of them. Um, but, uh, you know, we got a, a, a vast uh, web work of plant propagators that we use to that we try to obtain different species. I mean, it's for all over the place, all different kinds of venues. Because believe it or not, in the beginning, it was easy to find a new tree. But now that we have over 800 different species on the property, it's not that simple anymore to find a, a new species to plant. Okay. Um... Someone wanted to know, have the calorie pears started to seed in the adjacent properties? <laughs> no, they haven't. Um, because majority of the property is mowed. All the trees have tree rings and they're maintained. And when you're talking about invasive species, I haven't seen one calorie pear. The invasive species that I see are uh, Amur maples. Trident maples, those are probably the biggest, uh, or Acer tartaricum uh, and Acer genal, those are probably the, the worst. They, those we do see coming up all over the place. Okay, um, here's a question and it's from John. I noticed that your Picea pungens globosa has grown into a pyramidal shape. At what point would it be considered actually a cultivar such as Montgomery? I've read that many think they are both one and, and the same. Well, they could be, but one of the drawbacks is, is that when you go to a nursery and pick up any plant like that, a lot of times you're at the mercy that it is properly labeled when you purchased it there. So in reference, you know, all all we can do is go back and and you know document where we bought it from, which is part of being an arboretum and what they had it labeled as. But me, I personally, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. I mean, conifers really isn't my one of my strongest points, especially dwarf ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, unless anybody has any other questions, uh, I think that's about it. Um, I just want to thank everyone for attending, and it's great to have the opportunity to see these gardens, and I hope that once things open up, uh, people can come and visit you at Draves, and thank you very much, Tom, for doing this presentation. You're and welcome. I hope everyone stays safe, and I hope that you sign up for the rest of the presentations going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Everybody take care. See you guys later.